Today I'm going to talk about theme, and then I'm going to talk about thesis, and I'm going to talk about why we need to think about them both, why, when we use either one of them, when we use them together. So um, I'm talking very broadly about both theme and thesis tonight. Um, we're going to use a poem, but pretty much everything applies to poem or prose tonight, and then a little bit to the literary argument. So it's a very versatile lesson. Think Fiveable at Think Fiveable, yeah. Uh, Twitter, Insta Twitter, you Twitter, Insta YouTube, and Ugram, all of it. Everything that you can think of, hello, Rebecca. Everything that you can think of that connects you to people that maybe you've never seen before, but admire what they do, Fiveable is there. And if you're not following Fiveable, what are you doing? So today I'm going to, um, intro, which is what I pretty much just did. Um, I'm going to talk about analyzing a text for theme. We're going to talk about writing a theme statement. Then we're going to talk about responding to a prompt and creating a thesis statement, which is kind of sort of the same thing. And so now we have this new point for a thesis. So we definitely want you to have as many um, tools in your toolbox about creating a thesis statement as possible. So that's what we're going to do. And in the middle, we're going to read a poem together. That'll be awesome. And um, talk about the theme and create a thesis. And then it'll be time to, I don't know, go to bed or, you know, go to the next stream, perhaps. So the first thing is, when do I need to know things? So basically, like, what words will I see on the test that are going to imply to me that it's time to think about themes? So uh, meaning the work as a whole, you've probably heard that repeatedly already from your teacher. Um, anytime somebody responds to, hi, I know Julia. Um, anytime somebody, res somebody, anytime the prompt is talking about a larger meaning or a deeper meaning, um, they might still use those words. And really all the time, really, if you haven't been told something more specific to be thinking about, you're looking for theme. So you're looking for what it means, meaning of the work as a whole, which I like to call MOAO, but um it doesn't really roll off the tongue. So I don't, I don't do it too much. Um, so what is theme? And this is probably things, you know, I just want to make sure that we are all talking about the same thing. What are we talking about when we're talking about theme? So themes, the central idea of a poetry or prose text, it's a universal understanding about humanity or the human condition. That's actually my favorite definition, because I think that that is the one that really gets to what authors are doing when they create a theme. Um, also, the author's insight about life. If you've heard a different definition for theme, drop it in the chat and we can all see it. The more definitions we have, the bigger the understanding that we can develop. So if you have a definition that your teacher has told you for theme or a synonym for meaning of the work as a whole, uh, drop it in the chat and um, we'll all have more definitions. Uh, what theme is not? So theme's not the main idea, theme's not a summary, theme's not a word. Some people are taught in, in younger classes and lower classes that, you know, theme is, the theme is love, the theme is family, the theme is even the American dream, the theme is tolerance, but it's not. We are going to use those words in a moment, but it's going to be more than that. It's going to be a whole idea. It's always going to be a whole idea. It's always going to be a whole sentence uh, that you're putting together. Theme is not a cliche. I like to say if it's tattooed on someone's neck or stomach, it is not a theme. Love is blind. Um, only God can judge me. I don't know. I don't know what people tattoo on their necks and thug life, ne necks and stomachs. Um, but yeah, pretty much if you've seen it tattooed somewhere or somebody says it all the time or it's been lettered on an Instagram post, it is not a theme. So we have some questions here. We have some, some selections. So we got a little game I like to call theme or nah. So is this a theme? Give me a thumbs up in the chat if it's a theme. Give me a thumbs down if it's not, according to the definitions, according to what the list of what it's not, according to what your teacher has told you, according to what you've ever learned, right? So here we go. Everybody ready? Thank you. This is, you cannot, if you're not, if you haven't tried to stream, you cannot imagine 
how crazy it is to talk to silence. So thank you. All right, so here we go. Family over everything. Thumbs up if it's a theme. Thumbs down if it's not. Got a thumbs up. Got a yes. Got a yes. Anybody willing to say no? Family over everything is not a theme. Right. Oh, wait, is it? So here's why I'm going to say that it's not quite. And that is because a theme is a whole thought. So it's a whole sentence, right? Like a complete sentence, like a subject and a predicate, subject and verb, however you put sentences together. So family over everything doesn't say anything, right? It doesn't say enough. Also, I know quite a few people. I, I don't know them. I don't know them personally. I don't hang out with them. But I have seen lots of people with family over everything as a <laughs> tattoo <laughs> on their neck or stomach. This is the rule. This is the rule. I didn't make it up. I did make it up. Um, okay. Sometimes it's necessary to leave people behind. Theme, they'll be scared now. Is it a whole thought? Is it a message about life? Is it something that people are going to experience? Yes. 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 So see the difference, right? So this is an idea that everybody can dive into. Sometimes it's necessary to leave people behind. You might add to that, you know, in order to move forward. Sometimes it's necessary to leave people behind when they have, you know, shown you that they are out to hurt you only. Sometimes it's necessary to leave people behind when you realize their true selves, right? So this is the idea. So if we if we went back and we were trying to strengthen the first one, we would have a, a whole sentence like family is important, is more important than anything else. Um, we might even add, you know, especially in times of need, right? Light versus dark. Theme? No. Right? We get it. See how? Yes. No. 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 Thumbs down. Absolutely. Thank you. So we get that. It's clearly not a whole idea. Um, it's not even a statement, right? That light versus dark is an idea that we might want to explore. We might, if we see light and dark in a text, then we probably want to think about what that's telling us about humanity. Somebody might represent light. Someone might represent dark, right? And the last one, theme or gnaw, up or down, is it a theme? A boy learns about being an adult by learning to box or maybe learning karate or maybe learning to dance. Any, any movie you've enjoyed as a teenager or that I enjoyed as a young child, Karate Kid. What's the Julia Stiles movie? I keep wanting to say, so you think you can dance, but that's not it. Um, step up, right? No, not a theme because it is a summary. So this boy learning about being an adult by learning to box, we can't necessarily right? Attach ourselves to that. We can, we don't say this is something that happens in all of humanity. You learn how to box, you learn about being an adult, but it is a, a cliche, a cliched idea that a lot of people use, right? So like I said, you know, it could be learning karate. It could be learning to dance. It could be, um, I don't know, learning to read. It could be learning to discuss all the movies, right? There's some, there's some variation on this idea, but it's, it's a summary. So great. Yay, everybody gets a gold star. All right, so we're going to look at a poem in a moment and think about how do you get there? So if we know that, that a theme is what we're trying to find and we're almost always trying to find it, um, it's almost always what we're looking for, especially if we haven't been given a more specific prompt. Um, what are we looking for and what helps you get there? So pretty much everything that we talk about in English class, back to fifth grade. Literary devices are going to help you get to theme once you figure out what they mean or why they're used. Narration and characterization for sure because characters are us, right? So whatever a character goes through is making some statement about humanity or making an anti-statement about humanity. If you don't relate to that person, you probably don't have their lessons to learn but it doesn't mean that they're not applicable to everybody. So the idea is we're not gonna be specific to the text, we're gonna be specific to humans. Like, will a human encounter this? Absolutely, then it's a thing. 
um, conflict almost always. So if you are thinking about the plot mountain, right? So we have exposition and we have rising action and then we get up to the climax and then we come down, right? Whatever's at that down point, right? Um, whatever happens, if you can take that and apply it to anyone, then that's probably going to be a theme. When you take the personal um, names and, and specific events out, then you probably have a theme. Also, we have symbols and patterns, motifs, if you've learned about those. I love motifs. It's like this, the music in a scary movie. You know what's about to happen. They're, oh, suspense, right? I love it when authors make things easy for you. Um, and then structure, flashbacks, foreshadowing, flash forwards, all of that stuff. Uh, you're, you're looking for those things because they're what's going to create the theme. They're what's going to take you there. So you say, oh, well, this metaphor implies blank, probably theme. So in the call to action button, there is a poem. It's called Blackberry Picking. I'd like you to open it up because we're going to read it together. There we all are. Yay, Google Docs. And we're going to look at the poem, Blackberry Picking by Seamus Haney. This poem was used on an AP Lit Poetry prompt long, long, long ago. But I love it and I love blackberries. And so we're going to read it. So I'm gonna read it out loud because, really because nobody else can, right? And if it were my class, I would definitely not. But I'm gonna read it out loud because I'm the only one whose voice we can hear. So, Blackberry Picking by Seamus Haney. Late August, oh, sorry, before I read. While I'm reading, you are welcome to annotate with whatever you see. Draw a com make a comment, highlight something. You don't have to have it be some, you know, super detailed annotation. You just want to draw attention to the things that you see. So, we're looking for images. Imagery. We're looking for devices. We're looking for how the story's told. We're looking for symbols. We're looking for all of those things, right? Because we're still talking about things. So we're trying to figure out what this blackberry picking is going to have to do with anybody's life. So it's going to be a free for all. And if you don't, if you don't jump in, we'll go back and annotate. It'll be fine. But I do want you to feel free to point out anything that you see. And if you're pointing out the same thing as somebody else is pointing out, that's even better, right? We're all on the same page. So here we go. For the third time. Blackberry Picking by Seamus Haney. Late August, given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a knot. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones inked up and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hay fields, corn fields and potato drills, we tricked and pecked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones and on top, big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year, I hope they keep, knew they would not. I'm gonna give you a minute, go back and look at things that you saw before. And sometimes when we're reading a poem, we don't really know, or when we're reading anything, any text, we don't quite know what we want to say about something, but it stands out. And that's something that really, I think, happens in this poem is it's like, that resonates, right? It, it, it like, it's like, I want to go back and look at that, but I'm not really sure necessarily why. I, don't, I maybe don't know what to call it, and that's fine. 
because um, sometimes it doesn't matter what it's called. What it ma what matters is what's do what, it, what it's doing. Yeah, that second stanza it is full of crazy. Um, it's so intense and gets so close to everyone, right? So we're going to have a little bit of conversation. If you're annotating, don't stop. If you're highlighting, don't stop. Um, just a little, bit, a little bit of conversation about what it is that you did see. So we've got clot and not. There's some, there's some rhyme there. Um, it, at the end, it comes back, right? Um, so we late August, we're thinking that it's the summer harvest, right? And so that gives us a, a really strong sense of... Um, symbolism right late august is coming into fall we've got a harvest we're either gathering or starting to die one or the other um and we see that it's we're gathering that like you said harp megan harvest um and then we've got clot and knot we've got some rhyme here um you ate that first one and it's flushed with sweet summer's blood was in it that is such an intense thought like the flesh was sweet like thickened wine summer's blood was in it right summer's like bleeding here um and again like it's just one of those things to me that though that line right there it's not necessarily about the imagery or even the <laughs> the gustatory imagery right on your tongue it's that idea that summer is 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 thick in this fruit that's awesome uh, wet, gla wet grass bleached our boots. So that's another thing to think about, right? When I read this out loud and I have to slow down or my tongue starts to get tied, what's he doing with the words there? Uh, we've got hay fields, corn fields, and potato drills. There's a repetition of sounds. Um, and what does that feel like, right? What does that have to do with this late August summer, summer harvest? Good catch, Megan. And then we've got this sentence that just so we have some sentences right but this one like you said megan just lack of punctuation it does feel faster it feels more full right like these buckets of blackberries right so these things go together so we notice that this is a longer sentence also it starts up uh, starts out up here milk cans pea tins jam pots briar scratched right and then it starts to get a little slowed down because briars are scratching and the grass is bleaching the boots and they're trekking and picking and then we speed up again and it gets very full light as they pick these um as they pick the blackberries and then we have a lot of f words yes exactly so what does f do and i can't see you um i can't see me anymore but Think about sounds. What are what do P's have to do with your the way that you say the words? Because poems are meant to be read, right? It's like plays. These things are meant to be said out loud. And so he knows that you're going to have to slow down and say on top, big dark blobs burned in this line here. And so whereas on the one hand, there's no punctuation and it's speeding up. On the other hand, you're, you're slowing down with these sounds and are they i mean is it a smooth situation is it a scratchy situation briars scratching sounds like briar scratching it's almost onomatopoeia like i never thought about scratch being onomatopoeia but it does it's that sound right i just scratched for you so yay just scratched live um for the replay in perpetuity i'm scratching um and then we have uh, more f words we, when the bath was filled, we found a fur. Again, two things here are happening. One, it's smoothing out, and two, it's filling up. Same thing. And then we have the rot and the they would not. It comes back to this idea that we started off with, with the clot and the knot. And again, very final sounds, right? Rot ends it. It's not like sweet flesh would turn sour that that fades off into your into the air but a rot a knot a clot a knot right those sounds are very final and so we've looked at all these things and so who cares right <laughs> what are they all doing 
my running joke with myself and anybody that I talk to about AP Lit is always, you know, that there was a meme about the curtains were blue because the question is always, why are the curtains blue? So when we see these sounds, why does he have the rhyme here and not there? Why, why is, does he choose these sounds? Why does he choose Fs? Well, Fs are vulgar, right? So you, just like you say a lot of F words, we have a lot of F words. So I'm gonna come out of full screen for a moment there. And we've got this really full imagery in a very full time of the year. So August, I don't know where you all live, but in, in Atlanta, August feels heavy. It is a heavy month, right? So it's more humid. It's the clouds are always full. And so we have this very heavy feeling. Um, and then we've got cans full of blackberries and we've got heavy rain and sun and we've got thick and wine, everything. Yay, go Atlanta. Um, uh, so <laughs> side note, I've lived in air, all sides up, down, left, right, west, east, never Midwest. I haven't been there yet. Anybody live in the Midwest, invite me. Um, but we know that generally speaking, late August is, you know, a heavier time. It feels, you know, if you live in a, exactly, alliteration. Thank you, Rebecca. If you live in a place where um, you have seasons, there's a different, August feels different than June, right? And so it's this idea of feeling heavy and they're, they're, they're waiting for this, right? And he says, you ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine, it's the blood of summer. And so they've been waiting for this, this idea. So I could talk about this poem all night, but I won't because what we want to do is think about what is the meaning of this poem that's not about blackberries. We're not all going to be able to pick blackberries. And to tell you the truth, we don't all want to because they do have a lot of briars on them. And I would rather pick them up in the grocery store um, than get scratched up for my blackberries. I do love blackberries though. What is happening to this young speaker? So think about that. This is the question that I want you to be able to answer. What is happening to, not what is he doing, right? But what is happening to this speaker in the poem? Or think about it in another way, same question, phrased differently. What is this speaker finding out? And you can include the, black, the idea of blackberries if you'd like, or you can take it all the way to a theme. Um, but just try to answer that question. What is happening to the speaker? What is the speaker finding out? Speaker, yes, absolutely. Speaker, sad and sweet summer must come to an end. Absolutely. Because think about it, Megan, and everyone, <laughs> um, right? If we're saying the speaker is sad that the sweet summer must come to an end, then the summer is, is symbolic, symbolized by the blackberries. And then the end is symbolized by the rot, right? And that he, every year, this happens. Because does every year, does summer come to an end? Absolutely, right? And so we're thinking, we look and we see that it happens in August and we know that that's the end of summer. And so he's got a, a few different types of ends that are going on here. And so he, they're so excited to have these berries and then they fill them all up. And then, yes, absolutely, Ana Julia. So we have a disappointment, right? We even though, yes, Martha, absolutely, summer can symbolize happiness. And so if it's the end of summer, then it's happiness fading away. We can look at it that way. We can look at um, this idea that every year he goes and picks the blackberries and that first one is so sweet and so lovely. And it's the, you know, the blood of summer, that idea keeps coming back. And then that every year they get too many right? You, there are more blackberries than you can eat in that summer. And so every year you get this rat gray fungus, which is also extremely vivid. I hate the word vivid when, when used with imagery because imagery is vivid. That's the point of it. But that rat gray fungus, and you can see it, right? You can see it like kind of furry because everybody's had something go bad, right? And so when we put all those ideas together, the three of you, 
when we think about that summer's coming to an end, there's a disappointment that he's feeling and that the, the happiness then, if we take that to the next level and say, summer, the, the blackberries represent the summer and the summer represents happiness. So we can take all of those pieces to this speaker. Blackberries are happiness, but yet what happens to happiness? Exactly. Thank you. Megan and Tiffany came in together for the win, right? It can't last. It can't last forever. Blackberries can't last forever. Summer can't last forever, right? Nothing gold can stay if anybody's read The Outsiders. So in, even though, exactly, right, Martha. So if you say in this poem, the young man, I don't know why I call him a young man because the poet is a, is a man, but we'll, we'll make it a young woman. And why do I think that the speaker is young? Like what hap, what, what's said in the poem that makes it seem like this is a younger person? So if anybody has read uh, How to Read Literature Like a Professor, it's a very common book to read in AP literature. Exactly, yes, yes, Megan. Um, so that idea that ki that ki <laughs> oh, yes, I always felt like crying. Although, listen, you don't stop feeling like crying when you grow up. I promise. Um, but yeah, that idea that that it's it's a very simple idea um, that he felt like crying and that it wasn't fair. And that as the narrator in that moment, in that younger moment, right, it, it's too much for him to like think about, oh, well, life is not fair. You know, I know that all things must come to an end. It's not a mature uh, view, right? I felt like crying. It wasn't fair that they that they um, rotted, right? Exactly. So whereas an adult would be more likely to um, have a realization there, the speaker does not have that realization. And so the poem gives the realization, but the speaker is not really having it. So yes, exactly, Honor Julia. Um, so I'm going to, um, you guys can stay there and I am going to go back to my slides. So here I come, larger than life for a moment. There I am, yay. And going to go back slides. There's probably a smoother way to get this done, but I don't know what it is. And I tried to play with it and it didn't happen. So, all right. So we've got all our highlights, right? I hope that you guys can still look at it, um, that you still have it open. And we're, we've come to this idea, like we have a pretty strong idea we're, um, we're going to try to phrase it in a way that is analytical, right? Um, we're going to use all of our sound smarts um, to, to create this theme. So I'm going to give you a little template that you can um, hold on to. I like it because it takes the steps pretty slowly to get to theme. Okay, so we have this, I call it a thematic statement um, and you can use it on your way to a thesis. You can use it just to write yourself into a theme. Um, I, I find it very helpful. And so the idea is the more pieces that you have, the more full your, the your theme is. And so this first sentence is very straightforward and it's going to have you thinking about whatever big topic you pulled from your text. So in this case, we're going to use, well, you can, you can choose. I'm going to give you some options based on your conversation that happened in the chat. So the genre title by author, get all that out of the way, is about, and you're going to choose a, an abstract topic. You're going to choose this big idea, right? And it doesn't have to be a lot of words because we're not, it's, it's not the theme yet. It's going to get you to the theme. And so you're, choose, you're deciding in a word or two, what is this poem about right so what do the blackberries mean what does the rot mean like think about it that way and that we've already done and so then you're going to think about what is told to us by the author 
about that topic. So we looked at summer, which is an abstract topic, technically. Uh, but we looked at happiness. We looked at disappointment. Um, and so you can choose any of those. Uh, you can vote in the chat. If we want to say that it's about happiness, about summer, about disappointment, one or two words that you would say, this poem is about blank and it's an abstract topic as opposed to a summary. Got a vote for happiness? We can do it. Okay, all right. So we've got three strong votes for happiness. I say, let's roll. So we'll, that's our first sentence. The poem, Blackberry Picking by Seamus Haney is about happiness. And so then we're thinking, what is it that it tells us about happiness? Well, we've already talked about that, that uh, happiness must come to an end when what, right? Unless what? And so we're trying, we're just trying to create the reason that there's a qualifying focus is what I like to call it, um, is because we don't want to assume that themes are absolute, right? We, what we want to say is that in the context of the, not necessarily just the context of the poem, but that in the context of this kind of environment, this is what happens, right? So happiness um, comes to an end when you haven't prepared for it. Um, when you are disappointed, when you create expectations, right? So I'm gonna write that down. That is something I'm going to put it on the Blackberry picking document because that's going to be something that you can always find. So, oh, nice attachment. Yes. And so that would also go back. And the thing is, because of what we found, because of the rat gray fur, <laughs> um, we're always going to know exactly. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I can't see who said that. Tiffany, you took that right out of my head. Absolutely. We know that it's always going to come back to a an idea of disappointment. So really, even if we'd said disappointment as our abstract topic, we were going to probably then have happiness in our idea or focus, right? Because they're all going to come together because we all saw the same thing in the poem because that's what the poem is about. That's why the the blackberries are purple and the, and the fur is, and the rot is gray, right? This is why the curtains are blue. So our sentence, absolutely, you could be disappointed when happiness comes to an end. So our entire sentence, and again, I'm going to put this in the document so that you can come back to it and our collective annotation, which I love. I don't know if your teachers do it, but I think it's so awesome, especially when you don't have people who are um, putting, putting um, epithets and expletives in the comments. That can happen. You know, some people with their F words, where the F words go. Okay, so we've got the, the poem, uh, Blackberry Picking by Seamus Haney is about happiness. It suggests or reveals that, yes, thank you, Tiffany. Dif disappointment comes, I'm sorry, disappointment arrives when happiness comes to an end or happiness is ended by disappointment. It doesn't super matter. <laughs> I'm going to put words to it, but right, uh, the idea is that we've all figured out that if we were going to write this essay, that we're going to talk about the blackberries and the picking of the blackberries and the expectation, yes, of blackberries, because we know that in real life, the higher your expectations, the higher the risk for disappointment, right? So he's really excited about the blackberries, so excited to go get them, bucket full of blackberries, and um, then that comes to an end. Okay, so now we've talked about theme. We hit on the theme. We have this format for theme, but we're not always looking for theme. So really, I'm sorry, oh, well, here was, a, here was a sample that you can look at if you ever wanna look at the slides. But I think we made such a good sample that we didn't even need that one. Um, so we're going to skip over to a thesis. So the reason that I wanted to make these distinctions is because uh, your teacher might not, but I say thematic statement often, but I also say thesis statement. And so it's important to know that they might work together, but they're not the same thing. 
So theme is always going to be trying to get to that core of humanity, that human condition statement that the author is giving about life. Oh, good question. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to get to that in a minute. That that big idea about the about life that the text is giving, but that a thesis is going to be far more specific to a prompt. So a thesis is usually a response to a prompt, but it's always the argument that you are making about the text. So the theme is the argument that the author is making about life, whereas a thesis is the argument that you are making about the text. And so in APville, that's where we all live, um, it's responding to the prompt. Some people say that AP stands for answer the prompt. Okay, so thank you for all these questions. And I'm gonna try to, to, to answer them in order. Um, as long as you, the idea is that your thesis, if you have a prompt, your thesis is going to give all the answers. So last week, um, if you watched Laura, she talked about how to set up that thesis so that you are, I mean, sorry, how to deconstruct the prompt so that you know the big questions and the little questions. And so all the, the overview, right? Your thesis is the preview, not the long preview that you see when you go to the movie, but the 30 second preview that you see that makes you want to um, know more. And so you're going to lay it out there, especially now with this rubric that gives you a point for the thesis. The reader wants to know that you know what you're about to say. So Rebecca, a thesis is going to be about a sentence. It might be a fairly long sentence, depending on how much you're going to say, obviously, how you're going to structure what you're going to say, and um, how much is asked of you in the prompt. So some prompts are like about theme, right? But there's always going to be a, a way to get to the theme. And so if you answer, so for example, um, how does a pivotal moment um, contribute to the meaning of the work as a whole? If you put the moment in there, if you put the moment in the sentence and you put the uh, meaning of the work as a whole in the sentence, you have a, a thesis. And that thesis, so for example, if we were somehow using a poem to answer a literary argument question, which we never would, um, if we, if the, if the, I'm sorry, all this is not visual, but if the prompt, this is in, in response to Rebecca's, how long should a thesis be? If the prompt is right about a pivotal moment that contributed to the work, meaning of the work as a whole, it could be as simple as the speaker finding the um, mold on the berries conveyed to him that happiness doesn't last and your expectations will result in disappointments, period. And so that also kind of answers Mary Ann's question about to, to make it short, but analyze greatly. If you're looking for the most important part, it's after that. So the reason that I give all of this buildup is so that you can think in these pieces, right? You're like, what is it about? What does it say? But the that in part here is the is the theme. So that's the way to make it short is to take all of this extra out because that's those are the thinking supports for you, right? And so what you really are saying is that point blank, when your expectations are high for happiness, you will be disappointed. So I hope that that answered Rebecca's question and Mary Ann's question. Uh, unless you're prepared for both positive and negative results, but also part of the previous, yes. So yes, absolutely, unless you're prepared for positive and negative results, yes. So the so you are shifting, right, Ana Julia? So you're saying um, this idea of a qualifier, right, unless happiness comes to an end unless you are prepared for both positive and negative results, right? And also if you had looked at it from the disappointment um, if you had looked at it from the disappointment perspective, right, that disappointment is inevitable unless you are prepared for both positive and negative results. So really the better you prepare, exactly, yes. And so that's the fantastic thing, right, Tiffany, is that you can look at this in so many different ways and there are so many, There, I mean, it's 
innumerable, right? That we all are really looking at it, but we're all coming to basically the same conclusion. It's just what you, like your experiences give you your angle. And so a lot of times students are very focused on having something really distinctive and unique, but honestly, these poems are not given to you so that you can find the most distinctive, most unique reading of the poem. They're given to you because you should be able to fairly quickly, right, by the, by the time May comes, you should be able to fairly quickly find your angle on this theme. And so you don't want to spend time thinking, well, everybody's going to say that you know, um, happiness comes to an end. Everybody's going to say that expectation creates disappointment. I don't want to say that. Yes, absolutely. Say it, say it and say it well and get your thesis point and then support it well with clot and rot and not, and, and not right. And then you've got a, an essay and you're done and you're like, Whoa, how did I do that? Because you were ready to, and because you were, you were coming in with the expectation, right? The, that the higher the expectation, the higher the risk of disappointment. And so you want to come in with a very solid expectation that this is a poem that you can read and write about. Because it is. Okay, so before my time is up, I got so excited about blackberries and theses. Um, thesis. So the difference between theme and thesis is that thesis is going to answer the prompt and the, depending on what the prompt is asking for, it might be related to theme and it might not. So this is the prompt that went with that poem. So it was a poetry prompt. And so read the po following poem carefully, paying particular attention to the physical intensity of the language, right? And so that right there gives you far more direction than I did for theme. So now you know that you're paying attention to the physical intensity of the language and now you're looking at something completely different. Now you're looking at Summer's blood differently. Now you're looking at Briar Scratch differently because we're thinking about how he talks about the physical. Uh, then write a well-organized essay in which you explain how the poet conveys not just a literal description of picking blackberries, but a deeper understanding of the whole experience, which really is theme. You may wish to include analysis of such elements as diction, analysis of such, yeah, as diction, imagery, metaphor, rhyme, rhythm, and form. So again, if you've talked at all about these prompts, you know that there's a very strong likelihood that they will give you elements to look at and that you can know these elements are in the poem, but you don't have to write about them all. You wouldn't want to write about six different literary elements in your essay in 40 minutes because that would not give you a strong essay. It would give you a very um, popcorn essay. That's a technical literature term, by the way. Um, it, you would just be talking all over the place, right? If you tried to talk about, if you tried to write about all six of these elements. So you're reading this before you read the poem, obviously, in, you know, APville. And you're looking for physical intensity and you're looking for how the physical intensity um, is displayed through any of these elements and how that shows a deeper understanding of the whole experience. Because you know that blackberries are not just going to be blackberries. And so you're looking specifically for what the blackberries are. And so really quickly, um, that might, oops, that might look like one of these that I didn't finish. Um, so I'm not going to give you a template for a thesis because it probably would get you more stuck than it would get you rolling. Um, but the rule is here, second bullet, just answer the prompt. So if the prompt asks you how the poet conveys a deeper understanding of the whole experience, that's what your thesis is going to write. Now, I had a student who um, saw this in a way that none of us did, which is probably best. Um, but his argument was that the entire thing was about greed and murder, that um, the rot was actually about, um, okay, so there we go, Tiffany. Um, so that the rot was, you know, dying, right? And so um, 
one of the reasons why everything had to die. Uh oh, we're about to be over. I think um, one of the reasons that the um, that the rot that the everything has to die is because they were so greedy about um, clean basically cleaning out the blackberry orchard, and so that's what they said. So hidden within the deep ha within the excuse me hidden deep within the happy go lucky roofs of childhood is a disturbing tale of greed and murder. Seamus Haney, and this is where the thesis really starts. Seamus Haney, through clever diction, ghastly imagery, misguided metaphors, and abruptly changing forms, ingeniously tells the tale that is understood and rarely spoken aloud. So that's the idea. It asks you about the physical intensity of the language and how that shows the deeper experience. And so for this person, um, the deeper experience was that um, everything dies. Right, not, not only does everything die, but greed kills. And so these these happy-go-lucky kids um, that felt like it was unfair. And so it's arguable, right, that um, this is a little bit off kilter because it's hard to wrap in that it wasn't fair idea um, because when you are accusing someone of murder, then they usually don't step back and say, it's not fair that that thing is dead. Um, but as far as answering the prompt, it absolutely does. And this person was prepared to defend it. And so um, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that all, everything they've asked you to do, all of the big and little questions from the prompt are answered in your thesis. It's uh, 7.54. And so we want to wrap up. Are there any other questions that anybody has about thesis, about theme, about blackberries? Yes, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, I think the more specific your adjectives, the better, uh, just because, um, not like metaphor necessarily, but like to in, instead of calling the imagery intense, like to try to give it a name related to what it's doing. So like um, here, the person said ghastly. I was starting to say seasonal, right? Because we have this summer idea um, because it helps you. Absolutely, Rebecca, I'm sorry. So Tiffany, in the end of thought. Um, no, that's really good. What you have is very strong, right? But, the, the, but the, if you wanted to push it, if you wanted to push it even more, then you would think about being able to, I like to say name it, right? So name the imagery as opposed to exactly, right? So that lets you know and the reader know that you are not just parroting the prompt, right? That you know what you're about to write about. Um, that was poorly phrased, but that you have a strong analysis of the text that's going to lend itself to evidence and commentary. That's really what it's saying. Um, can you have a good thesis with only two literary devices? Absolutely you can, Rebecca. As a matter of fact, um, so that's a whole stream by itself, but you don't want to have too many because like I said about the six, right? You're going to not be able to support any of them very strongly. You're going to, if you have four, five, six, even maybe three or four, you're going to spend time touching on all of them as opposed to analyzing the strong ones that you can do well. And remember that this is A, a rough draft because you don't have time to, um, you have time to proofread, right? But you don't have time to give it a deep edit and talk to someone about what it is you're saying and whether or not you're saying it well. And so you do want to go in and you would rather talk, you would rather write about a few things well than write about quite a few things shallowly. So absolutely you can. And um, absolutely, yes, quality over quantity. And so if you have one solid paragraph, if you have an excellent paragraph, right, that's still going to be able to get you evidence and commentary points because you have put so much analysis in it. So thank you so much. We had um, all ladies contributing today, if I can make some assumptions. Um, and so it was a really good time. Thank you so much for annotating with me and um, figuring out this thesis statement theme.
that document is always going to be available in these slides, as you know, I'm sure um, can be checked in at any time. And I'm going to uh, just type up our collective theme statement um, on the document so that anytime you or anybody watching this replay wants to come back and look and see what a theme statement sounds like when um, eight great people put it together, uh, it'll be there. So thank you so much for coming and I'll see you next time here in AP Lit Streamland. Good night.